You can microwave your sponge to sanitize it. So we are going to dive into this and other microbiology myths. I want to welcome you to Microbiology Myths here at ASM Microbe 2022. I am Ashley Hagen, our scientific and digital editor, um, also the host of Meet the Microbiologist, and I'm joined here with Michael Schmidt, who is our co-host of This Week in Microbiology. The short answer is words mean things. And so what does it mean to sanitize? And where do you go to get the information of what sanitize actually means? The trick is you go to the EPA and you literally find out what the definitions mean. Now think about what we're doing with the sponge and the microwave. Now most sponges that we use around the house, the kitchen, the bath, they generally have soap affiliated with them. Soap is a membrane perturbinant. It effectively will poke holes in the membrane. Well, we know anything that will poke a hole in a bacterial membrane will destroy it. Similarly, soaps, if they are lipid enveloped viruses, will effectively destroy those as well. The thing you have to worry about is those non-enveloped viruses, the evil ones like norovirus that your kids can bring home from school and you can pick up on the cruise ship. And so when you microwave, what you're really doing is you're boiling and it's really time and target and load. And so how dirty the sponge is, how long you microwave it for, the power of your microwave, and until we're all experimentalists here, till we do the experiment, we don't actually know. The EPA has data out depending upon what it's looking for in chemicals and disinfectants that are designed to inactivate these things, but no one has looked at just throwing your sponge into a microwave because everybody's sponge is different. So it's complicated. Thank you. So it seems to me that a sponge may not be the best uh, household cleaning tool. Um, as I'm hearing what you're saying, you know, there's probably better, better objects to be using to clean your dishes and to uh, clean around the house. But if you are using a sponge, microwaving it um, may help for certain enveloped viruses. We just don't know necessarily how long, and we don't have certainty in that data to show us that it will sanitize all of the bugs. All of the bugs. Mm -hmm. And that's effectively what you're worried about right. because the infectious dose of a norovirus, the thing that your kid brings home, is 10. That's not very many. Those suckers are small. Ten noroviruses will send you to the toilet. All right, let's move on to our next myth. And this is that drinks containing alcohol, so beer, liquor, or wine, um, don't spread germs, um, so they're safe to share. So the first question you have to ask is, is the partner you're going to be sharing the wine, beer, or mixed drink with a sloppy feeder? You know, do they, you know, have backflow? You know, human beings don't have backflow valves when we're drinking, unlike your sprinkler system at home. Most municipal water companies require a backflow valve if you're using municipal water to effectively prevent backflow of whatever is weeping into your sprinkler system. And so it really is about the concentration of alcohol. Beer doesn't have very much alcohol. We all know from the recent unpleasantness, not the Civil War, but the pandemic, that we need about 66% ethanol, 66% ethanol, which is 132 proof. How many of you like to drink 132 proof alcohol? That is what we know has the fastest time of inactivating most of the microorganisms that make us sick. So it's time on target, and generally it's the concentration that you're trying to control. So it will work, but you really don't know about the inoculum the person is transferring back to you, and it just gets messy. 
Right. So it's a yes, but. It's a yes, but. Yeah. For a lot of these, I think that's yeah. kind of what we're going to find, right? It's a yes, but, and there's a lot of conditions and things to consider. Um, let's move on to talking about children. I have a couple of myths here that I wanted to talk to you about children. First of all, um, how many of you have heard it said that infants need to be bathed every day? Is that true? Well, we've all been attending, well, last night we had the opening session about the microbiome. What do we know about the skin microbiome? It's effectively a desert compared to our gut. It's a very dry environment. Also, what do we know about our skin? There are oils in it. Anyone who's gone through puberty, and I assume many of you have gone through puberty by the appearance of facial hair, um, you know that you secrete lots of oils. And it's these oils that are actually helping your skin stay healthy. It's given that your skin, the elasticity, and if you bathe your infant too often, you'll literally dry out their skin and then it will crack. And the other thing parents know for certain is small children have razor sharp nails and they can just literally grasp at you and literally cause a bloodletting wound. And so if they scratch themselves, you know, they may be introducing all sorts of bad things from the nether regions that you don't want to introduce into their skin. That makes sense. So how often should you bathe your infant? Well, my friends, the pediatricians at the Mayo Clinic say two to three times a week is generally the rule of thumb. And any of us who have had kids know that you're continuously changing diapers until they're potty trained and you clean those areas to prevent diaper rash, you know, wiping away the debris. And similarly, anyone who's ever burped a child knows what goes in does indeed come out, sometimes the top end. And of course, you effectively clean that up because what everybody loves to smell is that new baby smell. It's better than a new car smell. I mean, infants have this wondrous smell that I think is hardwired into our brains to make us want to take care of them. Because who else would want to take care of a screaming child? So it's interesting to me that this myth centers around infants um, and, and children. I'm curious, do these same principles apply then to adults? Three times they, do, a week? they do. Anyone who's worked on the skin microbiome know that if you fail to bathe for a while, the ammonia oxidizers evolve. And you develop this remarkable change in your odor. And it's dependent upon the foods that you are eating. And you can actually change the way you smell based on what you eat and how often you bathe. Interesting. So when it comes to personal sanitation, then, another myth I have here is that um, morning is the best time to apply deodorant. What nope. about that? Our friends in the deodorant business, and, you know, some of them are here on the floor doing other things, uh, they tell you the best time to apply deodorant, which, as its name implies, mass odors or antiperspirants, is at night when your diurnal rhythms have changed and you're not sweating and you apply those materials at that hour it's often better because they dry into your skin. They'll be better acting the following morning rather than running out to your next meeting and applying it on the go, as it were. There are many people with the stuff in their car. Yeah, absolutely. I have some in my bag right now. So, <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, so then what about a teething infant? Does that actually cause a fever? Well, you see... I teach dental students, so by osmosis, I have learned this. When do teeth erupt? Typically about six months, and, you know, that eruption takes on pain. Now, my grandmother, who took care of me as an infant, she said when I was teething, she soothed me by dipping her finger into fine Kentucky sipping whiskey and applied it to my gums. My mother shook her head no. She was going to let her mother do that to me. 
Um, so there may be something to it. My mother said what she would do is put a washcloth into the refrigerator with fresh water, if this was a clean washcloth, and I would tease on that, or better yet, a uh, pacifier ring, put it into the refrigerator, not the freezer, because you never want to expose that infant to frozen peas, a bag of frozen peas that we apply to our knees after playing basketball because we're old and decrepit. All right, let's move into some questions. I think that these may be a little bit more familiar to the group um, as far as myths go, um, but let's talk a little bit about reinfection. Um, is it possible to get the same cold twice? Yep. We've learned that lesson in spades, thanks to good old COVID. How many of you had COVID more than once? Now, we know Corona, it's, it's still the same coronavirus because we have our friend PCR and we have our antigen-specific test. And that virus is effectively changing its spots. But the way I explain coronavirus to many people is it's like a Tootsie Pop. It's got this big thing called spike that really looks like a Tootsie Pop. And how many of you have ever tasted a Tootsie Pop? There's grape ones, there's lime ones, there's orange ones, there's chocolate ones. But when you put that sucker into your mouth, still a Tootsie Pop. Your brain knows it's a Tootsie Pop. Similarly, when you're exposed to the coronavirus again, because the coronavirus we know has some immune modulatory genes that lie to our immune system, and there's probably going to be talks about that here at Microbe, we know that the, the T cells and the antibodies that you have circulating are going to try to react. But lime is different than grape. So it may, you may not like lime Tootsie Pops as well as you like the chocolate ones. And so you may toss it out before you get to that, you know, soft center. So, you know, for the most part, the second time you get corona, the third time, and it's similarly like that with the common cold virus, because they do indeed have ways of confusing our immune system, and our immune system has adapted to those sorts of viruses. All of these host microbe responses. Yeah. And there's an entire poster session <laughs> yonder. Yep. A hub track. Um, okay. So then yes, it's possible to get the same cold twice, but what about back to back? And um, to add to that, does throwing away your toothbrush after you've been sick, maybe with the cold or flu, uh, prevent chances of getting reinfected? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have a PCR machine in the house. So it's really, you know, the symptoms are principally all influenza-like. You know, you're tired, your nose runs, you have a fever maybe, and it's where that toothbrush is actually sitting. And you know when you flush, you generate fugitive emissions. And depending upon who's using the toilet, you know, you can be liberating viruses, you can be liberating bacteria, and you know, your body's reacting to all of the above. But the short answer is yes, you can get reinfected if your body hasn't mounted an appropriate and complete response. And the other thing we learned from COVID, everyone became an immunologist during COVID, is that how long does it take for your body to recognize and defend you against the virus? It's two weeks, three weeks, whether or not you're immune compromised, all the variations on the theme. All variable. Okay, so shut the toilet lid and don't leave your toothbrush on the counter. No, or don't put it on the toilet tank. Oh, definitely not on the toilet. <laughs> All right. Um, so what about wound healing? Um, if Does drying out a wound speed healing? No. Hmm. Um, last year, during the height of COVID, I had a cyst on my chest wall. So I go to the dermatologist to have it removed. And what he gives me to go home with is not a bottle of antibiotics, he gives me a tube of Vaseline. He said, this will prevent scarring. It will prevent the wound from drying out too quickly. 
you're able to shower and all of the other things, but you want to keep that skin moist so it can heal. It's all about healing. And by drying things out too quickly, they are effectively like the Great Salt Lake. They crack. And what you don't want to have happen is for your skin to crack because that will promote scarring and other bad things. So when in doubt, talk to your dermatologist and they'll fill you in. So along those lines of healing, this one struck me as I, I had not heard this as I was doing research um, and pulling up some myths, but fixing chapped hands with old sour cream. So the principle seems to apply to me here that you would, you would be keeping your chapped hands moist, but old sour cream, really? So l- let me ask the audience, what sour cream? It's effectively butter fat. It's typically about 30% butter fat. So you're lathering butter onto your hands. And, you know, before the days of Vaseline intensive care lotion, people used what they had in the house and they could allow the milk to go sour and rather than throwing it away, They applied it to their hands to prevent them from cracking because it was before the days of washing machines Mm -hmm. where we didn't have the luxury of the machine. We had to wash our clothes by hand, often using lye soaps Mm -hmm. that would crack our skin. And this was before the era of Playtex gloves Mm -hmm. to prevent your hands from drying out. All of these things, you know, these these old tales actually have a basis in fact. Absolutely. That resourcefulness, too, is yeah. really, it's really neat and it's striking to me to see that as we look through history, how people developed these therapeutics and things to help treat the, you know, the issues they were experiencing. All right, let's go to a lightning round if we okay. can. So I'm going to rapid fire some questions at you. Um, this one is uh, clear snot indicates virus or a viral infection, and green snot indicates bacterial infection? Oh, the snot questions. (laughs) You know, snot's really remarkable, mucus. Um, Let me ask the audience a question. How much mucus do you make a day? Wild guess. Use Coca-Cola cans as your model. You make about a liter and a half of mucus per day. And what does it do? It effectively takes the debris from your intake system, namely your mouth and your nose, and it washes away debris and sends it to an acid dump, namely your stomach. And the pH is really low, and that, of course, will destroy viruses and bacteria and all sorts of things. If you take a proton pump inhibitor, your pH of your stomach rises, and those folks get more infections because their stomach is not acidic enough. But you're right. probably trying to prevent a esophageal uh, reflux mm-hmm. type interactions. But the color of snot actually is remarkable. When it's clear, it's normal. But as you add color to it, brown and red are the most bad because that means you're bleeding and the blood is oxidized. So that's really bad. Black is really bad. You've been inhaling soot, so that's bad. The green and the yellow ones literally are instructing you that your immune system is sending in the cavalry. They are applying um, (laughs) antibodies to effectively change the color, and what you're detecting is serum. We've all seen serum. Yeah. Okay, how about chicken noodle soup fixes everything? Chicken noodle soup is effectively an electrolytically balanced ingredient list. And it's warm and it's comfortable and it keeps you hydrated and it generally makes you feel better because of the carbs and the noodles. There you go. So beneficial in lots of ways. Um, How about chewing gum? Swallowed chewing gum can stick in your stomach for seven years. What goes in must come out and it does indeed come out. It's effectively inert. It goes in and it goes out. If it happens to get stuck in a dire reticulum, it'll eventually work its way out. Um, Long COVID is contagious. Nope. And and there's more data being developed with each passing day. But the short answer right now is we don't know the infectious dose of the virus. 
and you're more likely to have been exposed to a new variant that your immune system is effectively triggering the other symptoms associated with COVID. Yeah, that makes sense. The flu vaccine or COVID vaccine can give you the flu or COVID. Nope. That's another myth. And I think this audience doesn't need any further explanation. How about high energy um, efficient washing machines? Oh, those are scary because they're always wet. Mm -hmm. And everyone in this room knows that when things are wet, what grows? The evil fungi. Elio Schechter's favorite thing to talk about. And you're literally going to grow mushrooms in your washing machine. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the washing machine companies are always trying to put antimicrobial compounds into the O-rings to prevent the fungi from growing. But if you look at your O-ring, if you have one of these front and loading washers, you notice sometimes they turn black Mm -hmm. from the growth of fungi. And they often smell bad too. Well, that comes (laughs) along because what are they eating? They're eating the soap. Yeah. Remember, Mm -hmm. fungi will eat anything. That's their mission in life is to eat anything. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, bacterial cells outnumber our own by 10 to 1. That is a short answer, TWIM 119. We discussed that paper that was published in PLOS. So go check out TWIM 119 and you'll find out. But we're one part human, one part bacterium. All right. I think we are at time. So I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you for being here and participating. Um, And we will see you next time.